other effects had been accepted by the by the developer community after the dilemma or disaster with Java FX1 when Oracle decided that Java FX2 has a Java interface. GrooveFX wanted to fill the gap to have a nice and concise um, DSL on top of Java FX for more declarative descriptive ways to create user interfaces like we we in Groovy are used to do in uh, for Swing. So, this is what I want to talk about in this talk. Just for me, my name is Alexander Klein. Everyone is, t is calling me Sasha. Sasha is the Russian short version of Alexander. Um, I live in Germany, work for Codecentric. I'm branch manager there and made for everything and um, fire extinguisher and technical advisor and whatever um, in Stuttgart. So, what is GrooveFX? As I said, it's, it's a library for JavaFX using Groovy. So it's, it's a DSL on top of that, and it's using the Groovy Builder pattern. Maybe some of you had been in my talk yesterday where I explained the Groovy Builder pattern a bit more in detail. Um, this DSL is very declarative, so you can see much more much easier than in JavaFX code normally, this Java code, um, how it might look like later on. And it's much simpler to write and easier to read. And this makes it more natural to, to use and to understand and to reduce uh, mistakes. Um, some, just some links for GrooveFX.org is the website and the GitHub project. Um, and the thing is that because it had been on the Codehouse page, and the Codehouse page is, uh, w went to Nirvana because Codehouse went down, um, there is a guy who cloned the whole repository, the whole old website, and um, has it on his page here, these groovy.jmiguel.eu. Uh, we, where you can get all the old documentation because the new documentation we have is not the same as the old one and there are some informations you only can find in the old one and the, some in the new one. So um, it's a nice way to have to find information from the old documentation part. So let's make a little example how it might look like what we have. So something like that, where we have a user interface with rotating stars, some visual effects. So how might this look like? I'm just closing that. How might this look like? I don't want to go into the details yet. I just want to show you for what you've just seen. So there's nothing else. So. Here you have a start that you say, okay, now I'm... Um, I would say something like a window. I feel like that. And inside of this window, you can have multiple scenes that you can switch. It's like views or pages in a web browser. And yeah, you say, okay, you fill it with a dark slay gray and you have a width and height and in there you have a border pane for um, look, um, positioning all the other components. And so you see, okay, inside there I have a top area and in the top area there I have, have a horizontal box and there I have a text and another text. And this text has a, is filled with a linear gradient. Even if you don't know all this element, you should be able to get an idea what we might have here. Not in a really visual factor, but much more than that you would have it in, in Java code. That is very serial. So let's have a look in more deep detail how something, um, how we can create some things like that. So as a simple example, have this little window with hello groove with X as a title and shut up and a Hello Groovy FX label in there. 
So, no? Yeah. All we have to do is we make a static import or kind of use directly to the start method in the GrooveFX class. And you give it a closure. So all this closure defines the content. And in there you say, okay, there's a stage in there, and this stage has a title, hello GrooveFX, and it should be visible, automatically shown after creating. Sometimes you want to create stages that are not visible at the moment and the beginning, and you can um, make them visible later on, programmatically. And in there you have a scene. Okay, let's say, okay, we want to style that for visual styling, um, JavaFX is using CSS. It's not the same CSS um, tags or mockups um, like we have in um, web CSS, but the, the logic is the same. And it is a bit like, um, yeah, it's always postponed by minus FX minus something because the semantics is a little bit different. I don't want to go into details of CSS styling, but in general, it has the same advantages as doing that for web pages. So, and then we have a label. The text in there is hello group with X, and I say, okay, the style from the style sheet is big. That's all we have to do there. And the general contract for that is that we have a container name and in like like stage, well, this is container because it can has uh, you can give it a closure so it can contain other elements, and then you can give it a value like this one on the label for example, and you can give a lot of attributes like visible, true, and style and title and so on. And um, these value here is in general is used for a very common used attribute. So in this case for the label it's text. Because you very often have to specify a text for label. They said okay if you don't give it a name for the attribute so the default um, parameter is the text. This is different depending on the uh, widgets. Normally you have to find it in the documentation. So. Then you can give it a closure if it's a container, and inside of the containers you can have subcontainers or nodes. Nodes are components that may not contain other components, like a label or a button or an image view or something like that. But technically it's the same logic. It's just um, closures um, or nodes with closures nested um, until there is no nested element anymore. So, if we want to have a look a little bit into how to create some forms, because that's very often that we have to do some form-like stuff, let's make a very simple thing, where I just have a label and a text field, and I can say, um, give it my name, and I say return, and then I, uh, the content is put into a label down there. Very simple. Nah. So, how could we achieve that? It's not so difficult, not so much lines of code more, because this is absolutely the same up until the style sheets, besides the title. But then, okay, let's have a virtual box. A virtual box or a VBox is something that lays out, it's a layout container that lays all, out all the uh, elements in a virtual line, uh, vertical line. There's as well an age box that does the same thing horizontal. So it's just putting them in one, order, in one direction. So then we have a label, then we have a text field, we have another label. So here this label gets a text. It's the name, what we just saw. Um, this label is where we want to put the result. Because of that, we give it an idea. An idea is um, a handle where we can just get hold of the label, that is, the label instance that is created. Um, and if you give, it, give any of these, uh, these nodes a attribute ID, then automatically in the context of the binder in here, so in this script, you get a variable that you can access with this name. 
So there, from there on, you have a result, and the result is this label, the instance of this label. We can see that here in the text field, because there we have the on action, this is what happens if on a text field if someone's hit and return, um, then this, this event or event is triggered and this method is called or this closure is ex executed. So, and here I say, okay, the text property of the result, and the result is this label, as we just saw, should be the text that I have in my event source, that is the text field. So and this is the way how this text whatever, moves down to this label. So sometimes, where is it here? Sometimes we want to have a little bit Yeah, more complex stuff, and sometimes it's very interesting to have, um, or very often it's interesting to have a interlinkage between elements that automatically actualize themselves. So here we had to do the return, hit return, and then we um, got the element put into the result label. Um, if I want to achieve something like that, that I automatically, while typing, get all the other um, elements actuali uh, actuated, I use something that is called binding. This is something that we had with third-party libraries for Swing as well, and for JavaFX has this um, out of the box, and it's greatly simplified by gr uh, GrooveFX. Because here I can just say, okay, here's my label, then I define my text field. Here in the risk case, you see I just create a variable. This is another way where how I can get hold of this reference, what is created here. I as well could make a ID colon my field. But here I just store in a variable. It's another way. It's nice as well. Um, so and then I say, OK, let's create a label. And the text property will be bound by the bind method to the text property of my field. So my field is the text field, and the text field has as well a text property. And I say, okay, the text property of the label, this one, and the text property of the text field, they should be bound together, so if the one is changed, the other changes as well. Um, in this way, this we, in ways we have um, unidirectional and bidirectional binding. Bidirectional means goes in both ways, and unidirectionally uh, direction goes in only in one way. Um, if it's possible, it's doing bidirectional, directional, but you as well can do it single. Uh, and if it's not, you can um, do it single connectional, um, directional. Um, but normally, you don't have to care about that. So using these text property, my field or text property with a with close uh, with brackets is the official JavaFX way how to accept, uh, access that to access access the property that could be bound. Um, but we just have two other ways to do. One thing is we have the text and then the brackets. It's just for being lazy; don't have to type the property stuff there. It's just the same than text property. It's automatically created normally or used. Or you as well can just do uh, bind the text itself that's doing the same as well, if it's a property. Um, and this is especially because in Swing Builder you're used to just bind the property itself or the value itself. Um, so that's not so unfamiliar from the old binder. So you can use all these ways. Another way is if you have the name of the text field in a string, you can just say, okay, bind on my field the property text. And sometimes, this works, it works with all the other options, sometimes you have the situation like here, that yes, I have the text Sasha, but I want to have something pre prefixed or postfixed, I want to transform the format, I want to make it uppercase or whatever, so you have to convert it somehow. So in this case, you can just add with dot using, you can add a converter. So this is called 
when the binding takes place, so something changed here, before putting the value into the new uh, property, the converter closure is called and the converter takes place, so and whatever it returns will be used to put into the other side. This, for example, is very important if you have um, different types, like you have checkboxes that gives you a Boolean value and because of that you want to show a yes or a no in a label or something like that. You have to convert it. Um, so another way how you can bind is the complete manual binding. This is like that. So for example, here I have a label. Give it a, the idea, last label, so I can access it later on. And here is the standalone binding. So sometimes it's wise to do that in a controller or do it in a separate position or you have a wanted more dynamic binding. Then you can say, okay, I have the bind method and then bind the text from last label to the text from my field. So this is very straightforward and easy to read, I think. So, but if you want to bind something, you want to need something to bind. So for the next example, um, I just have this simple stuff where I can give my uh, official name, for example, and I can change my birth date to, oh, it's always nice to being younger, um, so like that. And it automatically changes the label down there and calculates my age from the date that I selected. So, um, and the interesting thing here is that we say, okay, we have some kind of domain object, we have a person object. And GrooveFX helps very much in um, simplifying life because what we are used in Groovy is that a getter and a setter is automatically created. Um, and if we annotate it with fx bindable, then this getter and setter um, is not only created, but it is created in a way that along of it, these bindable properties that we need for JavaFX will be created alongside. And if I call the setter, then the property will notify it and um, the binding takes place. So I don't have things so differently in using my property. And all the other stuff is done by the annotation, ST transformation. So if I do that, and then I can just say, okay, create a new instance of person, like that. And in here, there, I can just say, okay, bind to the, to the name of the person. And it really binds to the name property that is created in here. We as well have the, for example, the person.birth or the person.birth property method. So this way I can easily bind all this stuff. And here, the same thing as before um, with the converter, but the nice thing here is, as you may be notifying, this is a closure. And a really powerful feature is that if you bind to a closure, then it listens to all the properties inside of the closure. So in this case, the birth and the name. And if any of these properties are changed, the event occurs. So in this case, it's not listening only to one uh, event emitter, but to two. And you could put in there multiples. So in this case, if one of these changes, these values in the person, then this converter will be called, and the string will be put into the text property of the label. So this is really an, a great enhancement that we get with GroovyFX that is by far not in JavaFX. So now we have some th things like binding and stuff, but now we want to place all the stuff somewhere. Um, so do some layouting. So for putting a image on the right side and a header on top and a text fill here and um, a label on the bottom, there is there are some kind of um, container-like or layout um, 
widgets or components that we can use. One of them is the border pane. If you ever worked with Swing or any other graphical stuff, it might feel comfortable. The border pane, like here, the border pane, it has four areas, the top, the center, the bottom, and the right, and in there you can place any other nodes. The center is optional, so if you just leave out the center, you see it's commented, everything that is not in top button or, the right, or right is automatically placed into the center. And if we have multiples, n multiple nodes in one of the areas, um, all of them will be put there and it's just stacked in the, um, in the order of definition. Um, as the next, if we want to lay out more in a grid way, so the grid layout, maybe you know the infamous grid bag layout from Swing. For such a form, here one thing, nice thing, we can just add the, the lines for the grids, for example, for, for debugging and um, developing. So here just an um, a small email formula, formula doing nothing at the moment. But yeah, this is what we want to have. Um, and it looks like that. We have our stage, we have a style sheet, our scene with style sheet. So we have the grid pane. And this is another node where we just say, OK, some things like horizontal and vertical gaps and padding in between the columns and alignments where it uh, where the elements will be placed, but beside that, um, we will define columns with the columns constraints that we put in there. We say, oh, well, minimal or 50, and this is um, right aligned, and the other is um, 250, and it always grows. So if we just take that, you see that this will grow alongside. Um, and then we put a label with some stuff, and here we have a, a style, um, like it's like the style tag on HTML, so for local CSS styling. And the interesting thing is we have a row, and we as well might have a column, um, like here, row and column, um, where in the grid this component will be placed. And we as well have the um, column span where we can say, okay, this will be placed in row zero, column zero, because we don't have a column. Uh, and then, but it should span over two columns. Uh, so th then it is placed here, over these two columns, as you see. And in there, the alignment, it should be centered. And then we as well have some margins. It's top, right, bottom, left. You see that with the, here you have top, there's no margin, left as well not, and here, uh, yeah, down there you have some margin. Um, as well, it's the same thing with the others, label and text field and so on, just where you just define, oh, it's this row, this column, and so on. Um, here, just for getting this grid stuff, I just save them. I can add events like mouse entered, mouse exited, and I just give it a closure. Very easy. And there I just say, okay, if mouse enter, then put the grid line visible true, else put it to false. Um, it is still sometimes very tedious to think about where should I place the stuff, but it's it's from my point of view, it's much better than the grid back layout, but still it's not the best layout manager that we find out there, but we will see later. So, another thing interesting is um, working with lists. So, in this example, we have a list of three infamous colors, blue, green, and red. We as well have the same list as the drop-down elements. And if I select one here, then the list will be selected as well. And if I select the red here, here we have the red, and the same thing will be saved, uh, stored, or shown in the label. So to get something like that, <coughs> I 
I need something where I save my selection, where I can bind to. Because of that, I just create a, a small selection holder class that just has a selected value. It's a Boolean. Uh, so, but, and I create an instance. I just need that because I have something where I have to bind to. Maybe I have a model, then I can just use the model to bind against. Here, this is my model class for separation of concerns. So then I have a list of colors here, not really colors, but strings of color names. And in here, I say, OK, I have a choice box. The choice box is this drop down. And I bind the value, the selected value. This is the value that is selected. I bind it to the value that is shown, so red, green, blue. And this is the list of items that should be shown in there. So this is just the normal default list. Uh, if you ever worked with JavaFX, you normally use special kind of lists, uh, observable lists. Um, GrooveFX will convert that under the hood. So if I put in a normal list, it will create an observable list from that and use this observable list inside. But you as well can give it an observable list. Um, then as well give it a list view. This is the normal list for showing. Um, I as well give the same list of colors or color names. And then for the selection, I have to add an event for on select. So if something is selected there, this event is called. And this just stores the item into the selection holder. So this is one way. So what we have achieved now is if I click into the list, the value will be stored into the selection holder. The selection holder is bound to the value of the choice box, so the choice box will change its selected or shown value, and we have it there. But we don't have everything up until now. What we need as well is what doesn't work up until now is that if the choice box changes, that the list selection changes. This we have to do in a second step. So we just say, OK, let's bind the selected value of the selection holder and say, if this changes, then please do these. So there we get the old value and the new value, and then I just say, OK, take my list, get, select, get the selection model, and then select this new value, this item. So now I have it bidirectional bound, the list and the choice box. And last but not least, I just bind the label, uh, the text of the label to the selected value in my selection holder. Then I have my label on the bottom. So, how are we in time? Okay. Um, so, if we want to get a bit more into tables, um, it might get a little bit complicated or com more complicated, not really complicated. So but what we have a, want to achieve is a table with different colors. Um, here we have the color itself. Here we have the web code, the opacity, the hue, the brightness, and saturation. So, um, But before so for that, we need to define the colors. And in JavaFX, we have color objects, JavaFX dot something, don't know the package at the moment, but there, yeah, there's a color object. So I have a list of color objects. And a lot of colors are defined as, com uh, as constants, like blue and green, but as well like groovy blue or other colors, uh, ocean green, um, that are defined in the, uh, in the groovy FX by default, so we can just use it by name. Uh, other, but you as well can define it by HSB, so U saturation brightness values, or by RGB, red, green, blue, as well with RGB with, um, with alpha channel, so opacity. And you as well have the chance to give it or to create a color by a color code, a web color code. Strangely enough, maybe I find a solution for that to have a nice uh, contribution to GrooveFX, but at the moment you need to, uh, to call it directly on the delegate because this string is just a string and it's not automatically triggering a method call. <coughs> we'll see. 
But these are the ways to define colors. So now we have to put that in, ta in a table. A table is called a table view, and there we can put the list of colors. So even the colors is work, uh, even a table is working with just a list of objects or whatever. And then let's start at the bottom. Let's take for the hue, brightness, and saturation. We know that a color object has the properties or the methods get hue, get brightness, get saturation. So we can take use of that and get the value directly out of the property. And here we define what is the header of the column. So here, U, brightness, saturation. We as well give some preferred width, uh, how, uh, how the column should be. And automatically, automatically it's taking, uh, calling the get U method, converting it to a string, and showing the string. So this is an, the easy way. But for the opacity, it's almost the same, but opacity is a double value. And we want to show the double value as a percentage value, so we have to put a converter here. So all we have to do is just adding a converter. And this converter gets the value, and then I'm just rounding, uh, multiplying by 100, rounding down, and adding the percentage. So I can ha uh, now I have a text in percentage and can show it. A bit more complicated, it will get if we want to create the web codes because this is not, there's no method for that, so we have to do that of our own. And the problem is that here you not only need only one property of the, co of the color, but you need three, the green, the red, and the blue value. So we are able and have to create a cell value factory. So it's a factory how to create the value for this cell in this color. And there we say, okay, let's take the color, this is the value that I get, and then take the RGB here, multiply by 255, and round it, uh, round it and store it, and then I can create a string with the format, and the problem is that I have to uh, return a, um, a read-only object, special kinds, but easily I can just put it into any value. In um, so it's the correct time to uh, type to get returned. So in this way, it's correct, uh, calculating the cell value from this color. Last but not least, for the color uh, rectangle to show we have a value factory, but the value factory... But we as well chain, we don't want to put it as a string. We want to put it as, yeah, I want to have a rectangle in there. So we have to create a own visual representation that we want to show. So we have the cell factory. This cell factory is for the whole column. And we can say, okay, create a rectangle. And this rectangle, has this size, and then from this rectangle, we have to return a table cell. So we create a, a say, okay, each time when a cell is drawn, and we just have to think about like stamps. This table cell is, cell is like a stamp that you put for each, each cell in this column per row. So, if this is drawn, the blue one, then the col uh, this method, the update item, is called, and the blue color, that is one of the color in the list that we are currently in, uh, will be put into there, and then I can say, okay, fill the rectangle with this color, or transparent, and then set this rectangle as the graphic to paint this cell. So, this way you can give any visual representation you'd like to, um, this is the way to create table cells. So, tang tang tang, like stamps, the first time with the blue color, the second with the green color, and so on. One thing that you might be aware of from um, Swing, um, there you have some kind of abstraction for 
um, for actions, for menu bars, toolboxes, buttons, and so on. This is something that JavaFX is lacking. Luckily, GroovyFX added that on top of the normal stuff. So we have these, in these action blocks, we can define actions with FX action. Here we can say, okay, the save action has the name save, the description, an accelerator, if it should be enabled or not, and what should happen if it is clicked or executed, whatever this means. For example, the exit will close the window. Um, so, this is just a definition, an abstract, but there we don't know what we are doing um, later on, or where it will be used, I would say. Um, we can use it in multiple locations, for example, in the menu bar. So, to show the example, what we have is this nice thing with a menu up here. Here you see the save is disabled as in the definition. We have edit. Here we have some checkbox menu entries, and a radio button, and this is just a checkbox. Um, we have as well some submenus. So in here as well you can see now it is savable, now it is not, and you as well have um, have a buttons or toolbar that as well using the same actions. So how to how to achieve that? Okay, create a menu bar. There we have the file menu with the menu op object, a menu item. And this is without the action. Normally you would say, okay, give it a name. And then, if the action occurs, then do that. This is the manual way. But as well, I can just give it a safe action. This is the safe action that I defined here. Um, and then I don't, I don't have to look, oh, what is the title and description. It just takes what it can show. And um, on top of that, I just say, okay, give it a small visual representation as a graphic that is a circle. Um, then a separator, and the same with the exit action. Um, down there, it's the same thing. Don't want to get into so much. Just as well, if you need it, you can look up. You as well put radio menu items in toggle groups. Um, but the other usage is, for example, here, where I have this checkbox. And here I say, okay, I have this checkbox, hmm, just a normal checkbox, but I bind what I want to do is I want to bind the selected property of this checkbox to the enabled property of the uh, to the selected property of the sa uh, select uh, to the safe action. The problem is the safe action is not bindable by default. What we can do is we can use the bean node that is wrapping around this behavior so we can bind to the safe action. Um, or putting it in into a toolbar in the bottom, I just have a button. Here is the normal way. I as well do the on action, as we saw it before in the menu bar. But I as well can give it an action, so it takes all the information out of the action it needs. So this is something that is given us by JavaFX, uh, GroovyFX on top of JavaFX. And it's sometimes, not very often, it's really handy to separate the action definition. For the charts, it's just something some to show now. It, I don't want to go into details. Um, there are some nice JavaFX charts where you can add um, values. So these are really nice and they're easy to define because here, just to see, okay, they have a pie chart. Um, and here I have another pie chart, and this pie chart, there I have the button that's just adding another slice into this pie chart, and so on. So it's very easy, don't want to go into details now, but you know where to find um, You see, GrooveFX is targeting to make complex things simple. As Venkat said yesterday, this is one of the best ways although it's not always the easiest. If we want to go a little bit more low level, up until the moment we just had um, components, 
that we want to show. Now we might go into more graphical stuff. For example, um, I can show paths. This is just a normal path. Um, okay, it's a little bit complex path, but this is not a picture. And you can see that here. I can define a path, and I say, okay, ignore the translate for a moment. I say, okay, this path has a stroke width, so this is the width of the line that should be on the borders of one, and um, some caps and joints, you know that maybe from some graphical program, so if there is an edge, should, should, um, should a corner be rounded, or should it pointy, or whatever. Um, beside that, I just say, okay, move to, the position, to this position, x, y, then make a cubic curve to this position with these control points. Cubic curves are the busy curves, and so on. So just I'm doing this movement that you would do in any graphical um, program, and here I say, okay, make a straight line up to this, and so on. This is a long stuff, and at the end, close this path. This is all you have to do. And now you say, yes, that's nice, but how should I recognize all these numbers? Luckily, one of the helpful things is that if you use Inkscape, um, you can export the Inkscape, no, where is it? You can export an Inkscape to JavaFX but it's the old JavaFX script from JavaFX 1. Maybe someone will do that as well for uh, JavaFX 2, but here this is creating the old JavaFX script, and luckily it's very, very similar, just different cases. So here we have move to this position, then make a cubic curve to there, make a cubic curve to there, and if you compare that a cubic curve 2 and line 2. So it's the same names, just different, um, different case um, and other small different formats. So you have curly brackets, here you would need round brackets, but this is, can be changed easily and automatically. So you can just take the information from this stored um, FX script and convert it if you need it. Um, for such complex paths, but if you have a half an arc, a uh, half circle, so an arc where something will move, it's easy to do it by hand. Um, another thing that is nice um, are shapes. So here, for example, as an animation, we have different shapes, a triangle, this arrow, this circle, this rectangle with the rounded edges. Um, if we want to have something like that, um, we have some kind of transitions. So you see, I start it again, it starts small and then it's growing. And as well we have the transition of the rotation. So. Here, we just say, okay, we have the rectangle. This is the rectangle around that. When you have some arc width, this is just the arcs of the corners, the rounded corners. This is the color. Okay, nice. Um, so far, we have a rectangle. Then we have a circle that we paint on top of that with the radius of, radius of 20 in color red. And then we want to have this strange arrow. And there we as well can um, take hold of, the, um, of some tools. For example, as well in Inkscape as in AI and other tools, we can, give, can get the SVG path format. This is what we can, if I just have a look, to a standard SVG. Here you have, in this D, you have this strange row of text. You can just take that and paste it into an SVG path of the content of it, and then we'll draw that. Um, sometimes, but what you as well need maybe is to do a translation. Translation is like a moving operation.
so I just scale it to 10%, but this is no big deal. So I can do these transformations. And now if we want to animate that stuff, we have multiple possibilities. So if we do the triangle, the problem is there is no basic element of triangle, so we use a, triangle, a polygon with the points, so x, y, x, y, x, y, x, y, and uh, there as well, translation, size, and so on. And here I have the mouse pressed. And um, I say, okay, no, let's, let's skip this for a moment, because inside here, yeah, inside of the, uh, the polygon as well as the content, I add a rotate transition. So transition is a changing of status. Uh, or it, and it should take place for two seconds and in linear, linear steps. Um, from 0 to or 2 minus 360 degree. And it should cycle indefinitely. So it's cycling, cycling, cycling. Um, and this, I just saw this rotate, store this rota in a variable rotation. And later on, if the mouse is pressed, I say, OK, if it's already running, then pause the rotation. If it's not running, then play the rotation. And the same thing I will do with the parallel transition, but here, you see, I have put this in a group. So all these rectangle stuff is in a group. Why? Um, because I want to rotate, or in this case, scale and move all the elements all together, and their relative positions should be the same. Um, if, and this I can achieve by putting that into a groove, uh, in the group and then make the transition to the whole group, then it will, the content will be relatively uh, to each other. So here I say, okay, if this transition is finished, print something, but then I mix two transitions because in parallel, so I have a translate, this means move it, and I have a scale position, so make it bigger. If I don't move it, I'll show it again, if I wouldn't sh move it, it would just get bigger here, and it will cannot be drawn completely because it's getting to the left side as well. So I have to move it to the right side. So these are some things like animation. So I know that we are getting out of, out of time because of that. I just want to show some things that would be nice, and um, you can get hold of the slides. Um, how to do that, but for example, I as well can animate kind of background. Um, I can do things like that. I hope you can see that a bit. You have this sun or this circle moving around a path, or a defined path where it's moving along, and I have here um, the hotspot of my background. So the hotspot of my background is just an effect. So I animated the effect. So for each um, step in my um, painting process, this will be repainted. So these things will be, will be possible as well, well, very easy. So this is all I have to do here. This is the transition of the circle, and this is the transition of the glow effect in the background. So um, just for completeness, Sometimes you have your own components or you want to use third-party components. So you can enhance GrooveFX. Um, either you just use the GrooveFX and I say, okay, I have this breadcrumb bar somewhere and I just have it, uh, in, if I put it to, into the node, node, <laughs> the node with the name node, um, I just give it the instance and then I as well can do what I'm used to, so I can give all the other attributes. And if this is the selected crump, then it will be the set selected crump method will be called. And here it will be called. But this is well important, for example, if you put, an, put that into a layout, a table layout with a row and color, for example, a column, then um, these arguments are not part of the component, but will be used by the layout. So they have to be there. This way you can do that. And in the case that you have another 
container. So another thing like the MIG layout, this is by way the best layout manager I already know out there. Um, but it's as well third party. I can just use the container. The difference between node and container is node is a leaf, so it cannot contain other elements. And container, there you can put content in, like these four buttons. Um, you as well have the possibility just to enhance or um, increase or put things into the language or these node names. So you can give, okay, I can register a bean factory for the name grid view. If I have something that a component that is a grid view, then I can just say, okay, grid view is the na new name. And as well, the same thing, and this is just not a factory, this is just the class of a component, like these breadcrumb bar before. Then it's using the standard things like getters and setters and properties, standard behavior. And if it's a bit more complex or com different, you can as well register uh, your own factory that you have written. Or here in this case, I just used this from uh, GrooveFX JavaFX factory, this message factory. Um, and then you can just use it here, grid view and message, as all the other nodes. So you just um, added your own words to the language. Um, so, and then, last but not least, if you're thinking in creating desktop applications, um, GrooveFX is great, but GrooveFX is just targeting the user interface, so the, the toolkit to show. Um, a framework that is as well using GrooveFX for one of the ways, if, because it can as well do Swing and Lanterna and others, um, is Gryphon, and I really would advise to have a look to Gryphon because it's a full-fledged application framework where you can write not only in Groovy, but as well Kotlin and Java, if you like to. And yes, you can use JavaFX with GrooveFX on top of that. You can Swing with the Swing Builder. You can use Pivot and Lanterna. And you have, you have a separation of concern in there. You can do MVC, MVVC, presentation model, whatever you want to. And a lot of, lot of useful stuff that many desktop applications are lacking or you want to have them for desktop applications. So just my hint, have a look to Griffin. I would like that because I'm committed there as well. And I think it's great. So Griffin Framework Org. So far, thank you very much. Do you have questions? No? So thanks, and have a nice and great conference. And if any questions occur, please come to me. <laughs>